Chapter 54, The Banker. The native of London is as proud of the city as if it were his own property. He can afford to be called a cockney for having been born within the sound of bow bells, for there are merchant princes and the peers and monopolists of the commerce of the world who bear the nickname as well as he. And as a side note, um, when they talk about bow bells, they're talking about the bells at Mary LeBeau Church, which is in Cheapside in London. It's said that to be a true cockney, you have to be born within hearing distance of the bow bells, of the bells in that church. So um, that's what they're referencing there. And well may the Londoner be proud of his city in numerous respects. It is the richest and most powerful that the world has ever seen. The dingy back parlors of Lombard Street, the upstairs business in rooms in Cheapside, and the warehouses with shutters half up the windows in Wood Street and its neighborhood are the mysterious places in which the springs of finance and trade of a mighty empire are set in motion. Half a dozen men in the city can command in an hour more wealth than either Rome or Babylon had to boast of at the respective periods of their greatest prosperity. And neither Rome nor Babylon possessed drapers who cleared their 50000 a year by selling gowns and shawls, nor sugar bakers with a million in hard cash, nor grocers with a plum in each hand, nor brewers to whom the rise or fall of one half penny per pot in the price of beer makes a difference of £40,000 per annum. Rome, Babylon, Thebes, and Carthage could all have been purchased by the East India Company with perhaps a mortgage upon the India docks. But the reader must not imagine that all which glitters is gold. Amongst the most splendid establishments in London and those most wealthy in appearance, there are some in a hopeless state of insolvency. To one of these we shall now introduce those who may choose to accompany us thither. The well-known banking, banking house of, of James Tomlinson was situated in Lombard Street. This is the dude we learned about earlier. The establishment was not extensive, nor were there a great many clerks, because it did little agency business for country banks, but was chiefly a house of deposit. It enjoyed a high reputation and was considered as safe as the presumed wealthy integrity and experience of its proprietor were likely to render it. It was moreover believed that the father of James Tomlinson was a sleeping partner. So like a silent partner. He was uh, involved behind the scenes, but not um, the perceived head of the organization. And as the old gentleman had retired from the business of oil man with an immense fortune, the bank was presumed to possess every guarantee of stability. It had existed for upwards of 60 years, having been founded and most successfully carried on by an uncle of James Tomlinson. James himself had originally entered the establishment as a clerk, whence he rose to be a partner and finally found himself at the head of the concern at his uncle's death. James Tomlinson was not an extravagant man, but he was not possessed of the ability and experience for which the world gave him credit. In the year 1826, and at the age of 40, he found himself at the head of a flourishing and respectable establishment. He was indeed the sole proprietor, for his father was in reality totally unconnected with it as a partner. James was intimately acquainted with the mechanical routine of the bank business, but he was deficient in those powers of combination and facilities of foresight which were necessary to enable him to lay out to the best advantage the monies deposited in his hands. So he was in over his head. With good intentions, he lacked talent. He was an excellent head clerk or junior partner, but he was totally unfitted for supreme management. Thus was it that in two or three years he experienced serious reverses, and although he carefully concealed the failure of his operations from all human eyes, the very safety of his establishment was seriously compromised. The French Revolution of 1830 ruined a Paris house to which Tomlinson had advanced a considerable sum, and this blow consummated the insolvency of his bank. He was then compelled to make a confidant of his cashier, an old and faithful servant of his uncle, and of frugal habits and kind but eccentric disposition. Michael Martin was this individual's name. He was of very repulsive appearance, stooping in his gait, bleary-eyed and dirty in person. He took vast quantities of snuff, but as much lodged upon his shirt frill and waistcoat as was thrust up his nose. Ugh. Thus his linen was invariably filthy in the extreme. His dress was a suit of seedy black, and the right thigh of his trousers was brown and grimy, with the marks of snuff, for upon that part of his attire did he invariably wipe his finger and thumb after taking a pinch of his brown rapi. <laughs> Such was the individual whom Tomlinson took into his confidence when the affairs of the bank grew desperate. 
Old Martin was close and reserved, and he was moreover possessed of a peculiar craftiness and cunning which admirably fitted him for the part that he was now to enact. Oh, another intrigue. Okay, here we go. Although it was next to impossible to retrieve the affairs of the bank, so great was the deficiency, still Michael Martin assured his master that it was quite probable that they might be enabled to carry on the establishment for a length of time, perhaps even many years, the chances that the draughts upon the bank would not equal the deposits being in their favor. Thus was this insolvent and ruined establishment carried on, with seeming respectability and success, by the perseverance of Tomlinson and the skill and craft of old Martin." So they're making it seem like the bank is solvent, but it's not, only because most of their business is deposits. And so they are unlikely to have someone pull out more money than they have in their possession, even though they can't account for all the money they've been given because they're so upside down. We shall now introduce our readers into the parlor of the bank at 10 o'clock in the morning after the incidents related in the preceding chapter. James Tomlinson had just arrived and was standing before the fire, glancing over the city article of the Times. He was a fine, tall, good-looking man, plainly dressed, and without the slightest affectation either in manner or attire. The bluntness and apparent straightforwardness of his character had won and secured him many friends amongst a class of men who regard frankness of disposition and plainness of demeanor as qualities indicative of solidity of position and regular habits of business." Then he was always at his post, always to be seen, and hence unlimited confidence was placed in him. Having glanced over the newspaper, which he held in his hand, he rang the bell. A clerk responded to the summons. Is Mr. Martin come yet? Yes, sir. Tell him to step this way. The clerk withdrew, and the old cashier entered the room, the door of which he carefully closed. Good morning, Michael, said the banker. What news? Worse and worse, answered the old man with a species of savage grunt. We have had a sad time of it for the last three months. Or the last seven or eight years, you may say, observed Tomlinson with a sigh. Then his countenance suddenly wore an expression of ineffable despair, and evanescent as, it, as evanescent as it was poignant. At first the work was easy enough, said Michael, a little combination intact enabled us to struggle on, but latterly the concern has fallen into so desperate a condition that I really fear when I come in the morning that it will never last through the day. Ooh, they're getting close to all this falling apart. What a life, exclaimed Tomlinson, and there are hundreds and thousands who pass up the street every day who say within themselves, how I wish I was James Tomlinson. Heavens, I would that I were a beggar in the street, a sweeper of a crossing, a pauper in a workhouse. Come, this is folly, interrupted the old cashier impatiently. We must go on to the end. What is the state of your book this morning, demanded the banker, putting the question with evident alarm, almost amounting to horror. 3,400 pounds, 18 shillings, 635 in notes, answered the cashier. Is that all, said Tomlinson, and this morning we have to pay Greenwood the 2,000 pounds he lent me six weeks ago. We can't part with the money, said the cashier rudely. Greenwood knows the circumstances of the bank and must give time. You know what Greenwood is, Michael ex explained to the banker. If we are not punctual with him, he will never lend us another shilling, and what should we have done without him on several occasions? I know all that, but look at the interest he makes you pay, muttered the cashier, and look at the risk he runs, added the banker. He finds it worth his while. I calculated the other day that we paid him 3,000 pounds last year for interest only. We can't go on much longer at that rate. I had almost said that the sooner it ends, the better, cried Tomlinson. What low trickery, what meanness, what abominable craft have we been compelled to resort to? Oh, if that affair with the treasury three years ago had only turned up well. If we could have secured the operation, we should have retrieved all our losses, enormous as they are. We should have built up the fortunes of the establishment upon a more solid foundation than ever. That was indeed a misfortune, observed the cashier, taking a huge pinch of snuff. And how the Chancellor of the Exchequer obtained his information about me at the 11th hour, after all previous inquiries, inquiries were known to be satisfactory, continued Tomlinson, I never could conjecture. At that time, the secret was confined to you and me and my father, to whom I communicated it, you remember, in that letter which I wrote to him soliciting 50,000 pounds. That's how they found out, because the post office read it. Which sum saved the bank at that period, observed Michael. Never shall I forget the day when I called at the Treasury for the decision of the government relative to my proposal, returned Tomlinson. The functionary who received me said in so pointed a manner, Mr. Tomlinson, you have not dealt candidly with us relative to your true position. Your secret is known to us, but rest assured that although we decline any negotiation with you, we will not betray you. 
This announcement came upon me like a thunderstroke. I was literally paralyzed. The functionary added with a sort of triumphant and yet mysterious smile, there is not a secret connected with the true position of any individual of any consequence in the city which escapes our knowledge. The government, sir, is omniscient. God alone can divine the sources of this intimate acquaintance with things locked up, as it were, in one's own bosom, added the banker thoughtfully. And this is not the only case in which such secrets have been discovered by the government, said the old cashier, again regaling his nose with a copious pinch of snuff. Yes, I myself have heard of other instances, observed the banker with a shudder. I have known great firms expend large sums of money to obtain particular information from Paris, Frankfurt, Madrid, by means of couriers, and this information has been dispatched by letter to their agents at Liverpool and Manchester, and elsewhere to answer certain commercial or financial purposes. Well, that information is has been known to government within a few hours, and the government broker has bought or sold stock accordingly. It's your letters. They're being read. Come on. <laughs> But how could the government obtain that information, demanded Martin, some treachery? No, impossible. The government has gleaned its knowledge when every human precaution against treachery and fraud was adopted. Look at my own case, said Tomlinson. You, my father, and myself alone in my secret. On you I can reckon as a man can reckon upon his own self. My father was incapable of betraying me, and I, of course, should not have divulged my own ruin. And yet the secret became known to the government. I shudder, Michael. Oh, I shudder when I think that we dwell in a country which vaunts its freedoms, yet where there exists the secret, dark, and mysterious element of the most hidden despotism. At this moment, a clerk entered and informed the cashier that he was wanted in the public office. As soon as Michael had disappeared, the banker walked up and down his parlor, a prey to the most maddening reflections. There were but 5,000 pounds left in the safe. 2,000 were to be paid to Greenwood, and every minute a check or two or three checks might be presented, which would crush the bank at one blow. 180,000 pounds of liability, murmured Tomlinson to himself, and 5,000 pounds to meet it. Ah, little thought those who passed by the banking house at that moment what heartfelt horrible tortures were endured by the master of the establishment in his own parlor. At length, Martin returned. His countenance never revealed any emotions, but he took snuff wholesale, and that was a fearful omen. Well, said Tomlinson in a hoarse and hollow voice, Alderman Phipps just drawn for twelve hundred pounds, and Colonel Brown for eight hundred, replied the cashier. Two thousand gone in a minute, said the banker. Shall I pay any more? asked the cashier. Yes, pay, pay up to the last farthing, answered Tomlinson. An accident to chance may save us as oftentimes before. And yet, methinks, Michael, that we never stood so near the verge of ruin as we do today. I suspect something's going to happen that saves them, but then puts them in bigger peril. It gets them embroiled in all of this that's going on in this story. Ah! And is there no expedient by which we can raise a few thousand pounds or even a few hundred for immediate wants? None that I know of, returned Martin, taking more snuff. At that moment, Mr. Greenwood was announced, and Michael withdrew from the parlor. "'You have called for your 2,000 pounds,' said the banker, after the usual interchange of civilities. "'Yes, I require that sum, particularly this morning,' replied the financier, "'for I am pledged to pay 15,000 at 12 o'clock to Count Alteroni.' "'This is very unfortunate,' observed Tomlinson. "'I am literally in this position. "'Take the money, and I must stop payment the next moment.' That is disagreeable, no doubt, said Greenwood, but the count is urgent. I cannot put him off. What can I do, cried Tomlinson. Greenwood, my good friend, I know you are rich. I know you can raise any amount you choose. Pray do not push me this morning. What am I to do, my dear fellow, said the financier. I must satisfy this count. I really cannot manage without the 2,000. I could let you have them again in a fortnight. A fortnight, said the banker, clenching his fist. Tomorrow it might be too late. Can you suggest no plan? Can you devise no scheme? Let me keep these 2,000 pounds for six weeks longer, a month longer, and ask me. Ask me what you will. I am desperate. I will do anything you bid me. Tell me how I can satisfy this ravenous Italian, said Greenwood, and I will let you keep the money for six months. You say you have to settle with this count for 15,000 pounds, required the banker. Greenwood nodded an affirmative. And does he require it all in hard cash? No, he will take the security of any responsible person or apparently responsible person <laughs> or apparently responsible because he's been trusting his money to Greenwood. <laughs> it was only apparently responsible. Oh, 
Uh, he will take the security of any responsible person or apparently responsible person added the financier with a significant smile, payable in six months. Tomlinson appeared to reflect profoundly. His reverie was interrupted by the entrance of old Martin taking snuff more vehemently than ever. The cashier whispered something in the banker's ear and then again retired. Seven hundred and fifty more gone, cried Tomlinson, and now, Greenwood, there remains in the safe but a fraction more than your two thousand pounds. Dictate your own terms. This was, a this was precisely the point to which the financier was anxious to arrive. Listen, he said, playing with his watch chain. This Count Alteroni will accept of you as his debtor instead of me. Take the responsibility off me onto your own shoulders, and I will make you a present of the two thousand pounds. What, said Tomlinson, incur a liability of fifteen thousand pounds to this count? Greenwood, you never can be serious. And that's a question mark, not <laughs> declaration of his character. I never was more serious in my life, returned the financier coolly. If you fail before the six months have elapsed, 15,000 more or less on your books will be nothing. If you contrive to carry on the establishment until the expiration of that period, I will help you out of the dilemma. You are not reasonable. You are anxious to crush me at once, cried Tomlinson. Well, be it so, Mr. Greenwood. Take your 2,000 pounds. And leave you to put up a notice on your doors, eh? Said Greenwood, still playing with his watch chain. Ah, has it come to this, exclaimed the banker. Ruin, disgrace, and beggary all in one day. But better that than submit to such terms as those which you dictate. With these words, he rang the bell violently. Old Martin immediately appeared, made his appearance. Mr. Martin, said Tomlinson, affecting a calmness which he was far from feeling, bring 2,000 pounds for Mr. Greenwood. It can't be done, growled Michael, taking a huge pinch of snuff. Can't be done, said the banker. No, said the old man doggedly, just paid 465 more. There isn't 2,000 in the safe. So he's stuck now. He's going to have to agree to Greenwood's terms. Tomlinson walked up to the room then. Then turning to Greenwood, he said, I will accept your proposal. Mr. Martin, he added, addressing the cashier, you can retire. I will settle this matter with Mr. Greenwood. The old man withdrew. When, where, and how is this business to be arranged, demanded Tomlinson after a short pause. The count is to call at my house at twelve. I have left a note to request him to come on hither. You had then already arranged this matter in your mind, said the banker ironically. Certainly, answered Greenwood with his usual coolness. I knew you would relieve me of this obligation, because I shall be enabled in return to afford you that assistance of which you stand so much in need. I must throw myself upon your generosity, said Tomlinson. It is now twelve. The count will soon be here. Half an hour passed away, and the Italian nobleman made his appearance. You see that I have kept my word, Count, exclaimed Mr. Greenwood with an ironical smile of triumph. Mr. Tomlinson holds in his hands certain funds of mine, which, according to the terms of agreement between us, he is to retain in his possession and use for a period of six months and six days from the present day at an interest of 4%. If you, Count Alteroni, will be willing to accept a transfer of 15,000 pounds of such funds in Mr. Tomlinson's hands from my name to your own, the bargain can be completed this moment. I cannot hesitate, Mr. Greenwood, said the Count, to accept a guarantee of such known stability as the name of Mr. Tomlinson. Then all that remains to be done, exclaimed the financier, is for you to return me my acknowledgement for the amount specified, and for Mr. Tomlinson to give you his in its place. Mr. Tomlinson has already give, re received my written authority for the transfer. The business was settled as Mr. Greenwood proposed. The Count returned the financier his receipt and accepted one from the banker. Now that this is concluded, Count, said Mr. Greenwood, placing the receipt in his pocketbook, I hope that our friendship will continue uninterrupted. Don't do it, Count. Don't do it. Pardon me, sir, returned the Count, his features assuming a stern expression. Although I am bound to admit that you have not wronged me in respect to money, you have dared to talk to me of my daughter, who is innocence and purity itself. Count Alteroni, began Mr. Greenwood, I am not aware. Silence, sir, cried the Italian noble imperatively. I have but one word more to say. Cir circumstances have revealed to me your profligate character, and never can I be too thankful that my daughter should have escaped an alliance with a man who bribes his agents to administer opiate drugs to an unprotected female for the vilest purposes. Oh, oh, oh. Mr. Tomlinson, added the Count, pardon me for having used such language in your apartment and in your presence. Okay, so the Count's like being tough and telling him, you're never you know, going to have a chance with my daughter. But he has just revealed to George Montague slash Mr. Greenwood 
that what happened with Eliza is known now, and hopefully Eliza is already out of the country, because otherwise she's in even more danger. Ah. Count Alteroni bowed politely to the banker, and darting a withering glance of mingled contempt and indignation upon the abashed and astounded Greenwood, took his departure. He talks of things which are quite new to me, said Greenwood, recovering an outward appearance of composure, although inwardly he was chagrined beyond description. Tomlinson made no reply. He was too much occupied with his own affairs to be able to afford attention to those of others. Greenwood shortly took his leave, delighted at having effectually settled his pecuniary obligations with the Count, in such a manner that it could never again be the means of molestation in respect to himself, but vexed at the discovery which the Italian nobleman had evidently made in respect to his conduct toward Eliza Sidney. Immediately after Mr. Greenwood had left the bank parlor, old Michael entered. This time he carried two snuff boxes open in his left hand, and at every two paces he took copious pinch with the forefinger and thumb of his right hand. This was a fearful omen, and Tr Tomlinson trembled. <laughs> so he's gone from taking a lot of snuff to actually carrying two boxes of it. Oh dear. Well, Michael, well, not a deposit this morning. Draughts come in like wildfires, said the old cashier. There is but a hundred pounds left in the safe. A hundred pounds, said the banker, clasping his hands together. And has it come to this length, to this at length, Michael? Yes, said the cashier gruffly. Then let us post a notice at once, cried Tomlinson. The establishment must be closed without another moment's delay. Will you write out the notice of stoppage of payment or shall I? Inquired Michael. Do it yourself, my good old friend. Do it for me, said the banker, whose countenance was ashy pale and whose limbs trembled under him as if he expected the officers of justice to drag him to a place of execution. The old cashier seated himself at the table and wrote out the announcement that the bank was unfortunately compelled to suspend its payments. He then read it to the ruined man, who was now pacing the apartments with agitated steps. Will that do? Yes, answered the banker, but in mercy let me leave the house ere that notice be made public. Tomlinson was about to rush distractedly out of the room when the cashier was summoned into the public department of the establishment. Five minutes elapsed ere his return. Five minutes, which appeared five hours to James Tomlinson. Okay, I wonder what's going on out there. At length, the old man came back, and this time he did not carry his snuff box in his hand. Someone must have made a deposit. Without uttering a word, he took the notice of stoppage off the table, crushed it in his hand, and threw it in the fire. Saved once more, he murmured, as he watched the paper burning to tinder, and when it was completely consumed, he took a long and hearty pinch of snuff. Saved, echoed Tomlinson. Do you mean that we are saved again? 7,467 pounds just paid in to Dobson and Dobbins's account, answered the cashier, coolly and leisurely, as if he himself experienced not the slightest emotion. In another hour, there were 15,000 pounds in the safe, and when the bank closed that evening at the usual time, this sum had swollen up to 20,000 and some hundreds. Ah, oh, if only that had been deposited before Mr. Greenwood came, they could have just paid him off and had the whole thing done. Oh, this day was a specimen of the life of James Tomlinson, the banker. Readers, when you pass by the grand commercial and financial establishments of this great metropolis, pause and reflect ere you envy their proprietors. In the parlors and offices of those reputed emporiums of wealth are men whose minds are a prey to the most agonizing feelings, the most poignant emotions. There is no situation so full of responsibility as that of a banker, no trust so sacred as that which is confided to him. When he falls, it is not the ruin of one man which is accomplished, it is the ruin of hundreds, perhaps thousands." The effect of that one failure are ram the effects of that one failure are ramified throughout a wide section of society. Widows and orphans are reduced to beggary, and those who have been well and tenderly nurtured are driven to the workhouse. And yet the law punishes not the great baker banker who fails and who involves thousands in his ruin. The petty trader who breaks for fifty thousand fifty pounds is thrown into prison and is plained at the tender mercy of the insolvent's court, which perhaps remands him to a debtor's jail for a year for having contracted debts without a reasonable chance of paying them. But the great banker, who commenced business with a hundred thousand pounds and who has dissipated five hundred thousand belonging to others, applies to the bankruptcy court, never sees the inside of a prison at all, and in due time receives a certificate, which clears him of all his liabilities, and enables him to begin the world anew. The petty trader passes a weary time in jail, and is then merely emancipated from his confinement, but not from his debts." His future exertions are clogged by an impending weight of liability. One system or the other is wrong. 
Decide, O oh, ye legislators who vaunt the wisdom of your ancestors, which should be retained and which abolished, or whether both should be modified. In the course of the evening, the Earl of Warrington called upon Mrs. Arlington, with whom he passed a few minutes alone in the drawing room. When his lordship had taken his departure, Diana returned to Eliza, whom she had left in another apartment, and placing a quantity of letters, folded but unsealed in her hand, said, These are the means of introduction to some of the first families in Montoni. They are written, I am, I am informed by an Italian nobleman of great influence, and whose name will act like a talisman in your behalf. They are sent unsealed according to usage, but the Earl has earnestly and positively desired that their contents be not examined in this country. He gave this injunction very seriously, added Diana with a smile, doubtless because he supposed that he was to deal with two daughters of Eve whose curiosity is invincible. He, however, charged me to, to deliver this message to you as delicately as possible. These letters, answered Eliza, glancing over their superscriptions, are addressed to strangers and not to me, and although I know they refer to me, I should not think of penetrating into their contents, either in England or elsewhere. But did you express to the Earl all the gratitude that I feel for his numerous and signal deeds of kindness? The Earl is well aware of your grateful feelings, replied Mrs. Arlington. Can you suppose that I would forget to paint all you experience for what he has already done, and what he will still do for you? He will see you for a moment ere your departure tomorrow to bid you farewell. I appreciate that act of condescension on his part, observed Eliza, affected even to tears, more than all else he has ever yet done for me. On the following day, Eliza Sidney, accompanied by the faithful Louisa and attended by an elderly valet who had been for years in the service of the Earl of Warrington, took her departure from London on her way to the Grand Duchy of Castelcicala. Okay, so she made it out of the country, but I have a feeling she's not out of danger, because that's not how these stories work. Ah, okay, so Isabella, it seems, is safe from Mr. Greenwood, but whether or not she's actually safe from him has yet to be seen. The Count has figured out Mr. Greenwood, but whether or not he'll actually get his money back has yet to be seen. Ah, all right, let's see you for the next chapter.